Hi. Um, first of all, thank you, John, for that very amusing introduction. And thank you to Rosemary and the Athens Center for hosting this wonderful event. And thank you to John, one of my very oldest friends, for inviting me to introduce Penny Turner this evening. Many of you don't need any introduction to Penny Turner. You, like me, probably heard of her when she was writing about her adventures with her horse George in the late lamented Athens News well over a decade ago. We followed her intrepid wanderings eagerly and kept wishing for more. We were astonished at her bravery, riding solo in the mountains of Greece, and even more astonished by what she found there, from a burial ground for murdered cows to unspeakably beautiful moments with wild creatures of all kinds, from vipers to rare salamanders and bigger mammals, not to mention meadows, woodlands, and colorful people. And now we finally have the book we've been waiting for. As I was rereading it last week, John, <laughs> and it pays rereading too, I was perhaps even more impressed with Penny's bravery, her fortitude, her integrity, and her humor, for she doesn't hesitate to make fun of herself when she does something that we know, as a reader, seems very foolish and possibly dangerous. Her story begins with preparations for the long ride of a single journey of a thousand miles on horseback from the tip of the Peloponnesus to Macedonia. This will earn her membership in the Long Riders Guild, which she was aiming for, and in the Royal Ge Geographical Society, which she was not. Her friends were appalled by her skimpy equipment and what they called her lack of preparations. Because she had to travel light, there was a limit to how much George could carry in addition to her. She didn't even take maps and reluctantly packed a mobile phone. When they'd asked, but how will you know where you are? Her answer was hard for them to understand. You don't care where you are. I don't think it's important. I think it's, even think it's important not to know where you are, because only then will you see what you see and not what you're expecting to see. If you don't know where you are, then you can have no preconceptions about the place, and this means you are more open to experiences of every kind. And Penny found everything there. <laughs> In any case, the phone proved to be totally useless. Most of the time, there was no signal at all. But I discovered, as I did a little research into Penny's background for this evening's talk, that she was more than adequately prepared for her long ride, and the shorter but just as adventurous rides that came after it. In fact, she covered a total of 8,000 kilometers over a period of 11 years in eight rides of one to three months, crisscrossing most of Greece, and did not suffer too much from saddle sores, because, as she says, she was practically born in the saddle, and when very young, had learned to track animals in the Devonshire countryside. She was thrilled by challenges. Taking the easy way was never for her. So that after she took her degrees in English literature and language, drama and teaching, and a few other subjects in Scotland, she taught immigrant children in London, some from rough neighborhoods. In fact, for her second job, she chose the roughest school she could find, the kind of place where people are trained not to win. She wanted to tell them it doesn't have to be like that. Some of the kids were from Cyprus, were separate refugees, and they taught Penny Greek in return. Then looking for more adventure, she moved to Thessaloniki about 40 years ago and taught in a language school before she opened a writing school. There they put on musicals and even invented a new genre, ballet on horseback. <laughs> when I first met Penny in the flesh, so to speak, in 2013, she was in Athens finishing a challenging project for Organosigi, Organization Earth, on, uh, which is part of the Serpieti estate in Ilion in western Athens. This involved turning a heavily polluted, abandoned sheepfold into a flourishing biodiversity garden, an experiment in watching nature heal itself. Then I discovered 
that she had also worked with the Arcturus and uh, Bear and Wolf Sanctuaries in Florida, and that she had taken two courses at the world famous Darrell Center in Jersey, where she became qualified to educate people about conservation. Conservation is one of Penny's passions, and this is of course very evident in Lost in the Wilds of Greece. As Penny takes us on her rides, we feel every blister and bruise. Amazed at her ability to sleep rough in the worst weather and go for long periods without much to eat. She almost never slept in the hotel, except at the end of the long ride as a celebration, though she was happy to share a barn with George, which didn't happen often enough. Um, the Greece she's exploring is unlike any we see in, in tourist brochures that advertise endless sunless, sunlit days. In fact, it seems to be main, raining most of the time when Penny is looking for shelter. <laughs> when I asked her how she managed to keep such a detailed diary, she told me, I kept a log every day, no matter what, but the hours or even days I spent drying out gave me lots of time to flesh out my jottings in detail. And when I asked her where she was ever afraid, she said no. Even when I was lost, I was never really frightened. I trusted that the mountains would somehow look after me. What frightened Penny more were the abuses to the environment she kept witnessing. Violations of tre treaties by mindless, greedy people and industries. Inappropriate projects carried out with EU money. The military using part of Mount Olympus as a firing range. <laughs> the mighty Pinos River drained for irrigation, hunters firing blindly into swirls of starlings. As Penny told me, I wrote the book because after I had made a few journeys, I realized that what I was privileged to see was very often the very last of something wonderful. I wanted to record it before it was lost forever. I believe that a writer has a duty to be a messenger, and I tried to bring news from places where very few people ever go. I wanted people to know what incomparable beauty is to be found in the wild places of Greece in the hope that somehow this could help them be preserved. I often also tried to do something positive to make things better, and I recorded my efforts to improve things. In conscience, I could not see the environment being degraded without trying and usually failing to make a difference. Even though Penny thinks she may not always have succeeded, her efforts were recognized by the John Muir's Trust of Scotland, which in 2010 presented her with a Conserver Award for her work in protecting wild nature. And she was also named BBC Wildlife Nature Writer of the Year in 2004. The conversation element is what makes Lost in the Wilds of Greece much more than an entertaining, unusual travelogue. <coughs> Penny takes us places most of us can never even dream of getting to, or maybe didn't even know exist. But she also introduces us to plenty of characters, some predictably horny and hostile, some predictably kind and wel welcoming with a keen eye, ear for dialogue. Fortunately, it seemed to be a rule that one nasty experience would be followed by dozens more that would restore one's faith in the human race. It, besides being a love affair with the mountains of Greece, Lost in the Wilds is also a beautiful portrait of a love affair between a two-legged creature and a four-legged one. We watch as the Horse George and Penny the Rider learn to trust each other and save each other from possibly dangerous situations. George actually saves her life, saves her from drowning in a wild river when she loses her balance with a heavy rucksack, while she protects him from panic attacks when he's confronted with turkeys or cows. <laughs> um, at some point, Penny mentions that her most important piece of equipment 
is the collapsible bucket to collect water for George. But re-readers would have to say that it was her Panasonic camera whose sturdy case made it immune to tumbles and downpours. For this book is illustrated with more than 200 exceptional color photos that make Penny's descriptions even more vivid. Need I mention that she also won an international nature ph photography competition in 2012. Congratulations, Penny, on a beautiful book and a wonderful, exciting, inspiring read. Now it's your turn to tell the story. <laughs> Very much, Diana. That's very, very kind. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start by showing a few pictures because I'm not terribly good at speaking and the pictures can say more than me. And then I will um, say a few words and then anybody who would like to, to ask anything can. When, when and if you want to ask something, you just have to wait to get the mic given to you because um, otherwise the, the rest of the audience can't hear you. Okay? So, some photos first. Okay. So, that is the wonderful and beautiful George. And he died uh, a few years ago and he was kind of irreplaceable. He had he, I expected him. I, I expected him to last quite a lot longer than he did, um, because he uh, he died when he was 16, and this type of horse usually lasts longer than that. So I was, but you know, I was unlucky that he he had that, he had a bad heart, and he just um, he died. And here's another picture of him. This is him, and we were on the top of um, a very high mountain, and the weather was terrible. And it was on Nyala, actually, a mountain's called Nyala, where 19 Andatis died in the, in the war, in the Civil War. And um, at the top of the mountain now, there is a, a, a chapel, and so I sheltered in the chapel, and George thought that he should come in the chapel too. <laughs> Yeah, it's not all bad news about the environment in Greece, and I would like to just show you one thing that has started to go quite well. Here is, here is Lake Aios Basilius um, about six years ago, and um, as you can see, it's completely dried up, and the mud was appallingly polluted, and everything was absolutely awful. And no, nobody could um, even begin to monitor the condition of the lake because um, they were supposed to pick up water, but they couldn't get to the water because the mud was too dangerous. And in fact, they tried to get there. Um, and this is one of my favorite stories because they, um, they got a little, th a little tiny miniature tractor with, tra with those wheels like a little tank. And they got some polystyrene, I suppose. And they thought if they put the polystyrene in front of it, it would go over the polystyrene and it wouldn't sink. But of course, it did sink. And so there was two biologists and a kind of miniature tank sunk in the middle of the lake, somewhere near where this boat is. And um, they had to be rescued with a helicopter. And the, the helicopter had to come from Larison. This is to the north of Thessaloniki. So they were there for a very long time, wearing their shirts over their heads so they didn't die. And then they were rescued, uh, you know, with a rope and a man climbing down and all that. So that was quite funny. And then they said, yeah, but what about, what about the little tank? And they said, oh, no, we can only rescue people. You'll have to get another helicopter to, <laughs> to rescue that. So after that, they gave up altogether about monitoring the lake. But... Um, one project that they had, they had 
So they had about, they had been paid by the EU for about 40 projects, none of which were in any way feasible. But finally, they have got a, a, something, and it's kind of working. I mean, it is ridiculously expensive, but it seems to seems to be better. But also the water table rose because three years ago there was an enormous amount of rain. But now the lake looks like this, and we can hope that it might stay looking like this. So, you know, there is some hope, and there are lots of birds there, so we, we can say that something, not everything is getting worse, some things are getting better. I would also like to talk about how our food is produced, and that all of us, because we have got the economic ability to, to make choices that we really should choose, if we can, to go for uh, organic food that is, and the animals should be outside, not inside, because this is what happens if they are not treated like that. I don't think any of us want milk from these kind of cows. It's not even legal to have cows in these conditions, but they are very largely kept in these conditions. And we can stop that by making choices about what we eat and making a big fuss, really. But you, you, have, to, you have to know that for many years, since about 2004, I have been fighting the, the industry about cattle and about the dangers to public health that the wrong use of cattle uh, results in. And um, that something that I noticed in 2004 was actually brought to court in 2015. And so again, things are getting better. Cows don't have to be kept like this. And more and more, it's becoming possible to force the situation so they are not kept like this. Hunting. Um, hunting, as Diana mentioned, hunting is a very serious problem in Greece. They have an enormous lobby with the government. And, of course, correct hunting, properly m monitored and so on, can be not harmful. But in Greece, there is, it is very much not monitored. and. Behind me, there is a photo of two other sets, which were just shot. And you can see, they were shot with one shot, and it was snowing, so they were low. They, they didn't have any defence. And that was done not far from Thessaloniki. And on that, in that same area, I managed to uh, photograph shot flamingos, shot whatever wonderful, beautiful birds you can think of. I saw... Had, photos of them and I photographed shot ones of those and I think that again what we have to think about is to see that the various NGOs that support the environment in Greece are really now trying to take on the hunting uh, lobby just to make sure that it's in some way controlled so that beautiful rare creatures and beautiful areas that ought to be protected totally are protected and I think that the more of us that understand that the more chance there is that we will have some of these beautiful creatures left. When we think that there's only about 25% of what was in Greece left, I think we, we, we do need to, to make sure that we, we, we know that. And these, these are um, glossy ibis, and again, this is something hopeful. They, most of the areas where they could breed um, were farmed in a way that was unsuitable for them, and they became rarer and rarer and rarer. 
but um, recently they have returned to areas like Prespa because the organisations, the NGOs there, have been working about grazing the land and uh, using it correctly. And that has meant that the fisheries have improved, the local produce of beans and stuff like that has increased, and the birds have come back. And you can see that these birds are just exquisitely beautiful. And it would be so sad if they were lost for no reason other than just incompetence and um, bad management. And the people at, at Prespa have, have done a, a miracle and, and made it possible for them and us to share that area and for it to, to thrive. So I'm very proud of them. And, and that's really all the photos I've got to show you. And um, so, and I would just like, I would just like to, to read one poem because I'm, and it's by Kavafi, and I want to, it's dedicated to all my friends who work in the environment in Greece, because they have and are doing such a fantastic job. So it's called, uh, it's by Kavafi, and it's called The Mopolai, and it says, Honour to those who in the life they lead define and guard a Thermopylae. Never betraying what is right, consistent and just in all they do, but showing pity also and compassion. Generous when they are rich, and when they are poor, still generous in small ways, still helping as much as they can, always speaking the truth, yet without hating those who lie. And even more honour is due to them when they foresee, as many do foresee, that in the end Ephialtes will make his appearance, that the Medes will break through after all. So, okay. any questions? I'm happy to answer any questions about my journeys, about anything. Yes? Are there any wild horses left in Greece? There are a feral, sorry, feral horses in Greece. They're not. That um, they've been domesticated, but they have re returned to the wild. So, and there are several breeds of horses that are unique to Greece. And uh, um, for example, on the island of Skyros, there are the Skyros horses. And in um, near the river, in, in the mountain of Pindos, there's a, a whole breed of horses there. And uh, down in the south, there's another breed of horses. And in each area where there is a breed of horses, they are specifically adapted to the kind of work that they need to do there. So, for example, the Pindos horses are not very tall. They're very strong uh, because they carry wood, and so they can't really be very tall, and they're very, very short-footed. And the Skyros horses uh, are very small because island animals uh, very often do become small because then they don't need to eat so much. And but they've got no serious enemies, so that's why there is a reduction in size with them. And the horses in the south of Greece, um, they are a bit bigger and heavier because they were used for uh, heavier work. And uh, there have been some very ill-advised efforts to kind of improve the Greek horses by, um, for example, there's a place in, near Thessaloniki called Diapata, which has breeding stock of all kinds of animals, bulls and sheep and um, goats and stuff. And they also brought some thoroughbred horses and other, and these they used to crossbreed with the local breeds, but actually they produced animals that weren't much use for anything because they weren't able to do the work that they had been bred and designed to do nor were they really a suitable cross. Uh, so they didn't really make particularly good other kinds of horses. I mean, I, I worked with those horses that were crossbred a lot, and they were okay in a riding school, but they, they weren't tough enough for the mountains, and they weren't really athletic enough to be, you know, show horses. So they were, they were fine for just riding or trekking, but they weren't really the best, they kind of, the cross was a, took away the best of both of those halves. So that, that, that project has now more or less stopped, which I think is a good thing because I think the, the local breeds were being lost without, without it being any gain to anybody, really. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, while you were on your journey, did you uh, meet other riders who were riding in the mountains? <laughs> I very seldom met anybody riding in the mountains. I mean, certainly not traveling a long distance. I met one guy once who was riding, he was, he was a Greek guy, and he was riding up Greece. Um, and, and other people that I met were just, you know, people from villages who happened to have horses and they saw me and they came to join me. But uh, that, was, that was all really, I mean, long distance riders, not, I didn't really meet anybody. So nobody joined you ever on your journey? For one guy did, while, one guy did join, join, join me and I really, I really didn't want to be joined at all. <laughs> I, um, as soon as I could find out where he was going, I said I was going somewhere else, and then I went somewhere else. Yeah. At first I tried to, um, he came through a village where I had stopped for the night, early in the morning, and he saw me, and he said, oh, we could travel together, and I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not ready to go yet. And he said, that's all right. I said, I'll go and, I'll go and wait for you. Oh. And then, um, then, he was waiting, so I had to had to travel with him, really. And I, I was very ill-natured about it, really, as well. I didn't... I was just cross. I didn't have to, and he spoke on his phone all the time, and he... You know, he, just, he just, anyway, so that's my experience of meeting people. Yes? 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 Um. The Greek mountains are very rocky and rough and sharp, and yeah. I would have thought it would be very difficult for a horse like George to cross them. Yeah, well, what I had to do was to go on tracks, really. Uh, if, I went, if I tried to go on footpaths, I had to, I, I would walk, basically, and he would follow me. And it was, it was hard for him. Uh, so I, I tried always to find, what I, what I would do when I was asking people, you know, I'd say, well, this village, how, how could you get there if you had a tractor? And they would say, oh, if I had a tractor, I would go this way, and then I would, try, I would tend to take that route. And I found that if I asked, could you get there with a tractor, it was probably okay. I mean, sometimes I, I did have to go on footpaths, but then I, I walked and he followed me. But if you didn't have a map, how did you know which village to ask? <laughs> ah, well, I, I usually had some kind of map, uh, but the maps are incredibly inaccurate. And also, once I was somewhere in the middle of Greece, I don't know, and I, I found I had it upside down anyway, so it made no difference. Because, I, you know, because what, basically what I would do is I would get in my head where I wanted to go in the direction, and I would say, I, I would perhaps find a, a place that I was heading towards. And I would say to people, you know, how would I get there? And they would always say, oh, well, you go on the asphalt and then you go on that huge road. And I say, no, I don't want to go on the huge road. I want to go on a little road um, or a path. Uh, and how would you get there with a the tractor? And then, then they would say, you know, and then I would get somewhere. And then I'd say, well, um, what village is this? And they would say things like, who wants to know? <laughs> say, say, I do. Why do you want to know? Well, I just, I just thought I would like to know what village this is, and then they would say what it was, and it, that was nice, really. Yeah. You are the tax collector. Yeah. 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 Uh, you mentioned um, in protection of nature and uh, the birds and uh, hunting, yeah. the, all the NGOs. I would like to put in a word for the forestry department. Oh, yes. Um, I think the uh, local forestry services, they're the ones that issue the licenses, but they're also the ones um, that do a lot of protection of the birds and often at risk of their lives because there have been... <coughs> um, some of the forest guards have been actually shot at by um, hunters who were um, didn't like them 
the res restrictions they were put on them. Yes. Um, and uh, it's not just the NGOs that are trying. I think the Forestry Department is trying its hardest under very difficult circumstances. It's had a lot of its budget reduced because it's uh, put over to the fire uh, department now. Yes. And, uh, um, I think the forests um, are another area that um, over the years I've been traveling Greece, um, a lot of the forest areas have improved remarkably. They're accessible because the forest department has roads into them and that probably you travel along a lot of the, a lot of the road tracks you travel along are probably Forest yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, just one more thing. The other thing is uh, the northern borders. Um, now um, we don't have a military presence on the northern borders. There are wonderful tracks up to what used to be the um, guard posts looking over the borders. So if people do like going up into the mountains and getting a view beyond Greece, <laughs> that's another uh, way to go. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, we, I, actually, nearly all the time I went along the borders, I never knew where the border was. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to do that um, 30 years ago. No, I'm sure. No, even even going around to Castoria or somewhere was a bit... Yes. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, uh, posts and, yeah. I just wanted to ask another uh, question about, you mentioned Bitsi going to villages up yeah. there in the wild mountains. Yes. What was that like? I mean, what was the most remote one that you ever went to, if you recall? <coughs> I don't know. It's still I, inhabited. The, 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 the thing is that there was, there's very many villages up in the mountains that have maybe two or three people left in them. and. I don't know which was the most remote one, really. Uh, no, and sometimes, I mean, there's one man, there was one place called um, Neraida, but it, its name wasn't really Neraida. They had changed it from Spinaza, which was its name, because they said that that was a uh, some uh, a Slavic name, I think. So they called it Neraida, and. The people who lived there said, no, it's not, it's not. Spinaza means a place where there are chaffinches. Spinos is a chaffinch. And so they said, they just changed the name. And, you know, we don't like that. <laughs> well, of course you don't like it, do you, if your village suddenly becomes called Naraida when it was called Spinaza, and, you know, that's okay. No. Yeah, so I, I think that um, a lot of the villages that have hardly got anybody left in them, are subject to rather a lot of abuse, really, you know, because there's so few people that they can't, they, they don't have any voice at all. And things like that happen, then, but it just called, gets called something else, or, you know, or they don't get, or they have a dimachos who, 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 who thinks it would be good to make you know, paths in the mountains or something like that. And they say, you know, well, and how am I supposed to walk around a path? And what I would really like is to be able to get to the doctor. You know, and things like that. So they, they aren't. They're ignored, really. And yes, and I think that's not a good thing. But it happens every, ev everywhere I went, where there were small villages with just two or three people left. They, they, they didn't have a voice. I didn't like that. Yeah. Did you or George ever need a doctor on your journey? Yeah. George, George got he trod on something. So I found a vet in a place called Descarti. He was okay. He gave me some things and we were all right. Yeah. <laughs> and it never happened to you? <laughs> Not that you would have something in your foot. <laughs> well, I was, I was sometimes ill, but I just, you know, I just, I remember once I, I, I got bitten by an insect or something anyway, so I lay down and uh, I kind of crashed out and I kind of woke up and was this, this <laughs> Poor shepherds looking at things. <laughs> shall, shall I get you a doctor? And I said, no, no, it's all right, it's all right, I'm fine. <laughs> he said, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing. So that was, that was all. The only time.
about George a little bit. Yeah. Um, first of all, how old was he when you were doing all this trekking? Uh, I got him when he was five and he hadn't been broken in. He was supposed to be a carriage horse and he he wouldn't pull a carriage. He, he <laughs> just wouldn't do that. So the man who had him wanted to sell him and I thought, well, he won't have to pull a carriage if I get him. So I trained him when he was five and we went on our first first long ride when he was six. And you uh, knew, sorry. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's, yeah. No, I was going to say, and uh, when you got him, you knew that he was uh, the right horse for this kind of trekking that you were going to do, or was it just a chance <laughs> choice? <laughs> well, the thing was, he was just so beautiful. I just, I just, I, I was looking for horses for, for customers, and you know, because I used to buy horses for people. And I just thought, no, nobody's having him except me. I'm going to have him. <laughs> so I just spent all my, all the money I, I could, and just asked everybody, can you lend me <laughs> a few? And so I bought him. And then, actually, he ended, he, he turned out to be perfect, really. I mean, he, he, was, he was a nutter in many ways, and he was very awkward. But he was really tough, and he was very good at looking after himself. So he ended up being perfect, really. I, I couldn't have done that with another kind, another horse, I don't think. Did he have some hard condition? Did it uh, manifest itself then, or did it come along later? No, um, no. He, he <coughs> that happened after he, we both got bitten by these insects, and he he kind of. I got terribly ill, and he got, and probably it was some kind of West Nile fever or something. Anyway, it affected his heart, so, yeah, so that's okay. what happened, yeah. Mm. Which of the areas of Greece was